Hello and welcome to this video about auto-scaling lifecycle policies and how can we apply those for security operations. My name is Jonathan Deloche and I'm a security solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. For background, I like to think about my AWS environments in one of two ways or divided into two different properties one of which is the configuration, and the other is the resultant set of resources that is derived from the configuration. As a security practitioner, I think of the former, the configuration, as a template or a definition of what is it that I'm expecting to see in my AWS account. Translating that into EC2 objects, I can think of the EC2 launch configuration. That launch configuration may be instantiated multiple times and defines the security group, the AMI, and other properties of those resources, which are the individual EC2 instances, which gets provisioned as a result of the launch configuration. An important distinction is that the launch configuration is typically governed and edited by humans as a result of business or operational changes, whereas EC2 instances as a function thereof automatically come and go as a result of auto-scaling operations. And these operations and the operations thereof are something that we would like to do automatically without involving any human on an ongoing basis as our application scales up and down. One challenge of rapid scaling is keeping track over the secrets and the corresponding identities that exist in my environment. A prime example of that may have to do with SSH hosts and host identities. In front of us is a screenshot of a Windows SSH client in which the client essentially tells us that he is unable to verify that this server in particular is who he claims to be and asks us if we want to proceed anyway. Lacking more information, maybe we choose to, to click yes and proceed, but really this is an indication that we're actually accepting a cookie from a stranger. We don't know for a fact that this server is who he claims to be, which is one of our servers. Translating this problem definition into EC2 auto scaling, think of it as a thought experiment. What is it about that instance, or more specifically, what the instance presents to us when it authenticates itself that makes it trustworthy? How can we take that and translate that into our five W's, which is who is that instance? what is the instance's configuration, where within the world or my network has this instance been provisioned, when was it launched, and why? Why is this instance trustworthy? A couple of real-life applications may revolve around cross-instance network authentication, a customer may have different instances representing different services who legitimately need to talk to each other, which raises the question of how can those different instances authenticate each other, especially in a dynamic environment such as an auto-scaling group. Alternatively, we may want to open on-premises firewall and make other configuration options and security decisions which extend outside of the AWS environment. Again, those need to happen on an ongoing basis as the instances churn. Another prime example in very real life is joining Active Directory, which we're going to touch on in a few slides. Putting that in context, ask yourself what makes this instance trustworthy for any of the above or perhaps other activities that you intended for. And with that, 
I would like to context switch into a demo which I've created beforehand using a CloudFormation whose link is available in the page containing this video. Context switching to our application. What we have is a three panel UI. On the left hand side, we have information regarding the uh, auto scaling group, which has been provisioned as a part of the cloud formation that I've just mentioned. We see the group's name, the, the minimum size thereof, the current desired capacity, and the maximum size. Using these two controls, we can configure the auto scaling group to instantiate more or less instances. In the middle, we have a panel that represents the instances which are currently running within our environment. Each instance is represented in one of these blocks. And on the right hand side, this is where we're going to see the auto scaling lifecycle events as we consume them after they've been fired by the service in response to scale operations. So currently, we have one instance which is in service and is already running. For the purpose of the demo, I'm going to use this widget to ask for that second instance. While the auto scaling is working in the background, I would like to spend a minute talking about some of these options. So for one, this button represents behind it the AC2 Describe Instance API, which was triggered when I clicked the button. And selectively, some of the fields of the response have been rendered on the web page. This goes to illustrate that by being able to tap into the AC2 APIs, we can make discovery operations as to what's within our environment and use this data in order to produce security decisions at runtime. Another important thing I'd like to talk about is the ability to get an SSH key from a running instance. The means in, this, in which this works actually relates to a feature of EC2 called get console or get console log. To show how it works, I'm going to jump to the backend EC2 console. I'm going to click this particular instance in type in question, which is 4E4. And we're going to get this system log. Typically, this is information that's used for troubleshooting purposes. But among all the other messages which we have here, which I'm scrolling down through, there is also the output of that host's SSH key pair as it was created during the host's first boot. I'm stressing that this is the key pair that represents the machine itself, which was created when the machine first booted from the AMI. And this is not the key pair which we're going to be using to authenticate ourselves to the machine. And in this case, we can see that by virtue of the AMI's configuration, which is standard across all the AWS published AMI's, the public portion of the key pair is outputted into the console. And that is available via both the console as well as the APIs. And that is, in fact, the backend method that is used here. When I click the Get SSH button, my demo application went to the backend asked for and received the console output, and then ran a regular expression looking for the particular pattern of the SSH RSA portion of the certificate. Refreshing the view now, we can see that this second instance, which I've provisioned earlier, is now available. Following the mechanics of the auto-scaling lifecycle configuration, it is not put the immediately in service, but rather it is put in the pending wait status. Again, tying that back to our previous thread of conversation, this is my opportunity programmatically to query the instance and gain more information on it, such as 
what is this instance's VPC ID, the private IP address within that VPC, the key pair, which is, again, the credentials that the instance expects me to produce, and the image ID of the instance itself. We can also get the SSH key, which is still not available as the instance is still booting, so I'm not going to wait for it. It's going to keep on running in the background. Refreshing the right-hand plane, here we can see the details of the auto-scaling lifecycle event that was fired. Here's the event's ID. That's the handle that we're going to present back to auto-scaling to unblock the operation. And here's all the data that was fired within the payload of that event. I purposely broke down this data combined with the instances metadata combined with the subsequent EC2 API calls for the purpose of the demo. In real life, it's very easy to cobble all those together into a seamless and completely automated experience, but this is not real life. In, in this demo, I'm purposely breaking down the flow of information into the byte size in which they can be consumed. And I put those behind a human interface to give me the opportunity to talk to those. So context switching back into real life. I'm listening into this SQS queue. I get these events as they get fired, and we can see the details thereof in which we have an EC2 instance launching. We can see the instance's ID, which gives us the opportunity to go find this particular instance, query EC2 just like we've just done over for more information for this instance, perhaps do some sort of additional querying such as um, secret exchange such as the SSH key. This is also our opportunity perhaps to log in into these instance and, and do all sorts of configuration um, options. And when we're done, as in when I'm happy that this is an instance that I control, which booted in the configuration that's approved by me, I've retrieved and disseminated the instance's secret, which is used for the SSH key. And again, let me show you how it's looking like for an existing instance. At this point, I've already paved the way for mutual authentication. I'm going to present to this instance this key pair. I'm going to validate that he presents to me this public key. And at that point, we can mutually authenticate. We can do whichever security operations we want to do. And when I'm perfectly happy with what I see, I can click this button, which in the context of our UI is going to unblock the execution and enable this instance to boot. To refresh, we can now see that this instance is in the pending proceed status. Content switching back into our deck. This pattern in which we have a service that listens in the back end for events which are fired and can operate perhaps at a higher level of privileges than the instances themselves which come and go unlocks certain security patterns. For example, if we were to join new instances into an Active Directory, by virtue of decoupling the privileges of AD from the instances themselves, we can avoid having a secret, which is the AD credentials, shared across more than one instances. Operationally, we can also take advantage of that to do some housekeeping, such as removing old records as instances go, which also has security value. In this example, the first event is the auto scaling group provisioning the instance. Then, number two, we're going to receive a message saying that this event has just occurred. Number three is our opportunity to ping the EC2 API calls or any other API calls and do the discovery work that we would like to do in order to have a better understanding of the current image. Number four is 
our watchdog service or the security configuration service going into Active Directory, presenting its own credentials and creating a computer account. Number five, using this new account and the credentials in it. So for the uninitiated, when we join a computer account into Active Directory, what happens is that there is a shared secret that's generated between the instance and Active Directory. Typically, that's done on the new machine itself and then communicated to AD alongside the credentials of a user. In our case, we don't want that. We, what we want to do is the alternative method, which Microsoft labels as offline domain join, in which the security configuration service creates the shared secret, communicates it to AD, then communicates the same secret, which is number five to the EC2 instance, at which point, number six, the instance and Active Directory can talk to each other and authenticate each other using this shared secret as was brokered by the security configuration service. At no point has the instance received the credentials to join any machine, including itself, into the Active Directory. Rather, what it got was a slot in Active Directory represented by the machine's account and the secret, the shared secret that it uses in order to authenticate itself as the rightful owner of this one and one only slot. Moving forward in the example number seven now, once we've initiated the computer account and transferred the shared secret, at that point we can notify the auto scanning group that the operation has been unblocked and it is free to proceed. At which point, number eight, it's going to register the instance within Autos, the Elastic Load Balancer and work it into the production rotation. Another example is the idea of having a workflow upon the instance's termination or just prior thereof. This gives us the opportunity to do a whole slew of security operations, such as intrusion detection. So for example, perhaps before terminating instances, we want to take an EBS snapshot of them and retain them for a certain time. Then once we have a snapshot, we can restore it into a watchdog service, which we can label as a high assurance system because at no point was it serving user traffic and mount it as a secondary local drive. Once we have a restored snapshot of the instance in question on the helper instance, again, operating in the higher level of assurance, we can use that to validate the operating system configuration against what we expect it to be. And on a different video, we're going to be talking about tools and technologies there to, for this purpose. Upon success, we can finally retire the instance and at our discretion, either delete the snapshot or retain it for a certain amount of time. And on failure, certainly we can call a human. What this gives us is the confidence in knowing that 100% of the instances that were retired have followed this decommissioning process, which involves backing and restoring from a backup. So we're testing our backup capability, as well as validating that the runtime image has not been modified against the specification versus what we expect it to be. Being able to tell such a story is a very powerful capability. And we're done. Thank you for joining and watching the videos. We're going to have additional videos that talk about some of the additional topics that we've talked about, such as governing human configuration of the actual configurations rather than the resultant resources thereof, as well as some patterns and ideas for doing intrusion detection upon instance termination. Thank you for joining. I'm Jonathan Deloche.